Good evening. Uh, tonight I'm testing out the limits of my new arm for the microphone. This is about as close as it gets right here. I could probably move it further down the table. It just clamps down. Uh, but I'm also showing you another baritone guitar. Take the tuner off because it's, it's staying in tune, surprisingly. Uh, you saw my Skull uh, baritone guitar before. Uh, this is my San Cristo baritone guitar. This is a 30-inch scale from nut to bridge. The bridge is just, I think it was 5 8 all thread right there. And it's what I finally settled on, made it actually play fairly well. And I put cut a couple of C-holes into it so it could be played acoustically. And just for, you know... So it does play, you know, it could be played acoustically. So uh, the other uh, thing we have going on with this uh, is the humbucker pickup. Uh, this ring here I actually had to build myself. Uh, the one that it came with was not conducive for what's going on here. Uh, there is no volume knob on this. Uh, oftentimes with the cigar box guitar you'll see it without a volume knob, you'll see it without a, a tone knob. Uh, it simplifies construction. And usually you're doing it on a small practice amp if you're doing something at all with it, or, or yeah, I mean you can add a you can add something like that on here if you want to. Um, I kind of chose this box because I kind of realized everything was really, you know, uh, masculine. If I was going to sell any of them, I, I, I wanted to appeal to a, a more feminine side, and so I ended up with the, with this box because it's flowers, and actually, you know, I kind of like it anyway. Uh, what does that make me? Who knows? Um, so what else is going on with this? I used. Uh, uh, curly maple for the neck here and I used purple heart for the fingerboard and purple heart is also in the sandwich spacer here just purple heart uh, fretted with a 30 inch scale and um, those are just cheap uh, cheap cheap tuning machines there which it's kind of like you know I mean it, it stays in tune pretty well uh, for, for an uh, but it gives that, uh, with the uh, baritone, it gives you a, a C. So the people playing a drop C tuning will understand that concept. And so it plays pretty good uh, for, you know, for, for uh, uh, drop C. We have a little bit of high action on this thing. Uh, if you look at the action on that, it's a little high. It works out fairly well for the sleet for the uh, slide. Um, but it is, however, still right on a C there. I mean, unless you're perfect pitch. If you're perfect pitch, you say, oh, it's a little bit sharp. It is just a little tiny bit sharp. So it does do a pretty good job. The intonation is pretty good on this thing. So, um, but it's fun to play. I'm not hooked into a bass amp of any kind right now. I'm just hooked into uh, straight jacked into the computer uh, through Focusrite. There is no amp simul simulator in here. I really probably ought to get into that a little bit. But um, just want to show this off a little bit because it's another baritone. Uh, I believe so I've only made two of these. One was the skull, and the other kind of went the other direction. Um, the tone on this is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to play. Get 
that base going. Um, you can kind of run your own baseline with that as opposed to you know, some of the other options there. Uh, so like I said, slide action. So, yeah, get out to your garage, build one. Or if you don't want to build one, give me a holler. I'd sell you this one. But you know what? I'd rather you go out and build your own. So, all right, next up is a Bible study. Hey, and we're back. Uh, I have to admit, I haven't done a video in two weeks now. Uh, proper video on uh, Galatians, anyway. Um, but, you know, uh, the great news is that God is always patiently waiting for us. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how it's going to work into it here, but I live in the in Washington State, and this last this weekend we had a shooting in uh, Burlington, which is yeah, you know, it's a couple hours north of me. Uh, you know, and I want you, if you're watching this, uh, put these people, the the the, uh, the victims' families, in your prayers. Um, pray for them, please. Uh, 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 put them in God's hands. Uh, help them through their grief. Help them with uh, some sort of clarity of understanding as to how, how you know these stupid things can happen. I don't know much. I, don't, I know very few particulars about it. I'm not a big news watcher. Uh, I try to stay out of the uh, uh, a lot of the stuff that's out there. But uh, I used to get in deeply into it, and it caused me nothing but trouble uh, because you just never have all the information. So I, if you, yeah, if you pray, please pray for those families uh, up there, and you know, anyway. I want to get that out. Uh, so, I am woefully unprepared today. Uh, as you can see, I, I haven't even highlighted through this thing. I've read through it twice, of course, and um, you know, asked myself questions and and things like that. But um, so we're you know we're gonna, we're going to kind of run through this quickly. I have dinner in the oven, and uh, we're going to be. Uh, taking pauses for that because I have to deal with that a little bit here and there but uh this is Galatians chapter 2 verses 11 through 21 it is chapter 4 in your book uh, Galatians for you and uh let's go ahead and read the read the verses Peter Paul opposes Peter when Peter came to Antioch I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they, when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that, that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observance of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while, seek, if while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I, build what I, if I rebuild what I destroy, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by, by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could, not, could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Here ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. I will be right back. Okay, so I'm back. I'm going to get started here. We've done the reading of uh, a yeah, very interesting. Paul opposes Peter. 
That's the end. That was by the way. That was the NIV. As always, that's the Bible I have. So let's see here. Uh, Paul visits, Paul's visit to Jerusalem established the great uniting truth that we are saved by faith in Christ, nothing else and nothing more. Now he switches his focus from standing alongside Peter in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, to standing against him in Antioch, a Gentile city. Both times, what matters to Paul more than anything is the gospel, the gospel which, in this passage, he summarizes for the first time in the letter as justification by faith. Verse 11 is astonishing. We have two, we have the two apostles meeting together and one of them recalls that he opposed the other to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. What could cause the two apostles to be in such opposition? Uh, <laughs> um, Paul explains the pre presenting issue simply. Paul had changed his eating habits. He used to eat with the Gentiles. He began to draw himself, draw back, back and separate himself from the Gentiles. Um, yeah, and we, we've discussed uh, uh, the, the laws, uh, we'll do that quite a bit in this, uh, of a first century Jew. A first century Jew, it made perfect sense to not eat with Gentiles. It made perfect sense to, uh, uh, you know, to do these customs because it's what made you clean and to eat with Gentiles made you unclean. And that's, uh, and that's one of the things we, we cover uh, that, uh, is covered in this. Uh, is it, you know, we, you know, there's, there were all, there was over 600 laws that they had to follow and many of them had to do with eating and who, you, and who you're with. And Paul had begun to separate himself from the Gentiles when uh, certain people showed up and were trying to, uh, give him, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, to, to push him towards, okay, you should, you're, you're a proper Jew. You should be eating as a proper Jew. You shouldn't be eating with these, these Gentiles. Um, so despite Jesus, despite Jesus explaining that with his arrival, the time for these laws had passed, God had said to send Peter a vision to show him why the ceremonial ceremonial law was finished. He saw a great sheet full of animal, animals, forbidden for eating in the Old Testament. And he heard a voice saying, Kill and eat. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Um, so I, I do know people who, who are uh, Seventh-day Adventists who still hold to many of the, uh, the laws of eating and, and in spite of this. And, and I, I don't begrudge them that. Uh, uh, you know, they don't tell me I have to. Um, so uh, they'll still eat with me. So, you know, even if they won't put ham on the menu. Um, God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him. Uh, this is an important aspect, the difference between um, uh, the Jews and, and the Gentiles and, uh, you know, some of the different things. God does not show favoritism. He loved, the, you know, he, he came to the Jewish people first. He came to the Hebrews first. Uh, but... Then he sent Jesus, and, and, and he came to Paul and, and sent them out to, uh, to the rest of the world to see. Afterwards, he eats with Gentiles despite criticism. Even later, he argues that the Gentiles have been purified, made clean by faith. Peter began eating with the Gentiles because God had shown him that no one is unclean in Christ. So when Peter withdrew from the Gentiles, he was guilty of hypocrisy. In Galatians 2.13, we read that. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Barnabas, one of the ones that was uh, an apostle with a small with a, with a um, uh, But when it came to the Gentiles, he had simply stopped acting in accord with these convictions, and this hypocrisy was infectious. Um, and it's one of the things you have to remember with Barnabas was that he was actually a partner with Titus, Titus, who was a Greek, who was uncircumcised, who was not one of the, uh, one of the people, um, uh, you can imagine. Sorry, Titus. I know we've been hanging together for a long time. I know we've been, been good friends. I can't eat with you. I mean, see, see what Peter's doing over here. I mean, Peter, can I, can I eat with them? I, I mean, I mean, you're not eating with the, with the Gentiles, so I shouldn't either. Right. Right. Okay. So, and that's exactly what's going on. And see, and you can see where this leads. Uh, what caused this hypocrisy? He was afraid. 
Likely, Peter was afraid, afraid of criticism from those who belonged to the circumcision group, the people he identified with. Uh, Peter identified, you know, I mean, his, 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 his whole life he had been a Jew. And, um, and so, uh, you know, to, to now he was spending time with, with uh, the, the unclean, as it were. So, um, uh, likely Paul was afraid of criticism from those who belonged to the circumcision group, which is Paul's way of describing salvation through Christ plus something, teachers. So one thing we haven't done, which I didn't do earlier, and we've gone through this at all yet. So we're going to start with, uh, uh, we read it. Uh, Peter was one of Jesus' closest friend, who, friends who had seen him teach, heal, live, die, and rise. What is surprising about verse 11? Verse 11, he was taking, you know, uh, somebody who lived with Jesus, walked with Jesus, saw the miracles, was ignoring the teachings. I mean, that's just. I mean, it's, I guess that's uh, uh, was was not not uh, not living the way Christ wanted him to. Um, how did Paul view Peter and Barnabas' actions? And what is significant about this insight? Do you think uh, that was in verse fourteen? When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jew Jewish customs? So, here he was, Peter and Barnabas, uh, were Jews living as Gentiles. They were not following the customs. Um, they were not, you know, doing the, you know, washing their hands before every meal. They were not, uh, they were eating un what were considered unclean foods. And then they began um, uh, uh, telling the Gentiles that they had to start doing that very thing that they had stopped doing. Uh, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's, you know, kind of hypocrisy right there. Um, okay. What are the ways in which we can insist other Christians act as we do, or even hold them to a higher standard than we hold ourselves. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. How about uh, 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 sexual thoughts, sexual actions, uh, drinking, uh, attending church every single Sunday? Uh, there's a plethora of things, um, and we're, we're we're horrible about it. I don't know. We're, we're hypocrites, aren't we? So um, that's just a thought on that. Uh, I'm sure you can come up with some good answers there yourselves. Uh, what are the reasons we find ourselves? What are the reasons we find ourselves doing this? Um, verse 12 gives us one motivation. Uh, verse 12: Before certain men came out, uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, th I think I think fear fear is a big one. We want to fit in. We want to be like everybody else, and um, you know, and we don't want to not do it. We want to be you know in uh, in control of these things and um you know so it's one of those let's get back over here to this but in addition racial pride must have entered into it it had been drilled into peter and all the jews since their youth that gentiles were unclean while hiding beneath the facade of religious observance Peter and other Jewish Christians were probably still feeling disdain for Christians from in, from inferior national and racial backgrounds. Peter was allowing cultural differences to become more important than gospel unity. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, the the whole concept of identifying as a Jew. Uh, uh, we identify as Americans or British or, or uh, Australian or you know, German or wherever you happen to be watching this at, we identify very, very tightly with our culture. And, uh, these things, uh, and, and these things draw us away from the body of Christ of, uh, following Christ as Christ wanted and not doing it as we want to do it. Um, and, um, so I think that's a, that's a big deal there. 
straight walking, Paul does not primarily see his fellow apostles' behavior as rude or unmannered or unwelcoming as we might. Fundamentally, he sees that something deeper is going on. Peter is not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. In verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew. Yes, so. Peter is not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Literally, Paul says that he is not ortho walking with the gospel. The prefix ortho means to be straight. So we go to an orthodontist to straighten our teeth or orthodox religion. Um, so this means first that the gospel is the truth. It is a message, a set of claims. It includes the fact that we are weak and sinful and we can seek to control our lives by being our own saviors and lords, that God's law was fulfilled by Christ for us, that we, we are now accepted completely, though we are still very sinful and flawed, and so on. Um, the gospel is a truth. It is a message, a set of claims. And crucially, it means, second, that this gospel truth has a vast number of implications for all of life. It's our job to bring everything in our lives in line with the thrust or direction of the gospel. We are to think about its implications in every area of our lives. We seek to bring our thinking, our feeling, and behavior in line. The gospel truth is radically opposed to the assumptions of the world, but since we live in the world, we have embraced many of the world's assumptions. Christian living is therefore a continually realignment process, one of bringing everything in line with the, gospel, with the truth of the gospel. Um, a perfect example of this is... is uh, um, how often do you go to church on Sunday morning? You spend an hour, uh, hour and a half, uh, however long your service is, raising your hands, praising Jesus, uh, listening to the sermon, giving your tithes, uh, come home and it's football Sunday, crack open a beer, yell, scream, shout, cuss at the TV. Yeah, um, been guilty of that. Don't drink anymore, but otherwise, yeah, <laughs> I've been known to do that. Um and then we go about our lives in the, in, you know, during the week and we go to work and we talk to the guys or the gals, or whichever, whichever you're talking to. And it might be gossip. It might be, uh, you know, talking about the opposite sex. It could be talking about uh, uh, the football game even. Um, uh, and we just and we just kind of forget. We forget what we're doing on Sunday. So and. That's part of the reason I do this. And so we need to continually realign ourselves with it. And and, do, and doing this for me is part of it. Uh, part of it is uh, this Wednesday I have a deacons meeting. That will be a part of it. Uh, and this this coming weekend I have a men's retreat. That's also a part of it. Is realigning yourself and focusing yourself back to Christ. Um, Peter's sin is basically the sin of nationalism. He insisted that Christians can't be be really pleased to, pleasing to God unless they become Jewish. But nationalism is just one form of legalism. Legalism is looking to something besides Jesus Christ in order to be acceptable and clean before God. Legalism always results in pride and fear, psychologically, and exclusion and strife socially. That's um, that strikes me. That strikes a chord with me um, because we have such a separation in our society today. We have such a political and a racial separation in, uh, in the United States, here in the United States. Uh, I really can't speak for other countries uh, where you may be watching, but um, I mean, it's very clear in the United States that we currently have a, a real problem with uh, um, legalism attitudes of separation and strife and this person is better than that person it's very difficult to uh it, you know you follow christ and we're all supposed to be on the same page with christ but we have such a difficulty getting past skin color or where you grew up or what country you're from that we have a tough time coming together as followers of christ and i encourage um that if you know somebody uh, that has this trouble, talk to them about it, you know, um, or if you are this person that has trouble with it, can you think of somebody that, um, uh, maybe you don't talk to that's a Christian, uh, because they're in a different socioeconomic place than you are. 
maybe they have more money than you. Maybe they have less money than you. Maybe they live in a in a single wide mobile home and uh, have hardly any teeth left, but they're good followers of Christ. And you're a professional, you know, whatever, uh, in, uh, lawyer. And, you know, personally, I work in sales and my job. I have no college education, literally. Um, but uh, as a follower of Christ, I'm, you know, we're all there together. We're all part of the body of Christ. And um, I think this is, uh, this is very important in today's day and age. There are many examples today of similar sorts of exclusive social behavior based on a failure to understand and live out justification by faith. So here are just a few. One way is to be sectarian. Every Christian group or denomination necessarily has many distinctions of belief and practice that have less to do with the core gospel beliefs and more to do with specific convictions about ethical behavior or church policy. It is extremely easy to stress our distinctions in order to demonstrate to ourselves and others that our church is the superior or best one. Have you ever seen uh, you know, things where Catholics versus Protestants, uh, Methodists versus Baptists, uh, you know, maybe this versus that. And you, you've seen it. I've seen it. And, you know, I hate it when I see it. Another way is to bring classist, nationalistic, or racist attitudes from the world into our church. We all knew no Christians who belonged to classes, groups, or personality types that we had previously disdained in our lives outside the church. Working class Christians may have a distaste for Christians from wealthier or more socially refined backgrounds and vice versa. Christians from one political persuasion may be upset by the presence of those from another end of the spectrum. Yeah. Okay. Democrats, Republicans, guess what? Christ doesn't really fit in either one of our boxes. Okay? So, quit trying to say Christ would have been a Republican or Christ would have been a Democrat. You know, he would have looked at both of us and said, you're stupid. Okay, anyway, sorry. Very talented Christians may feel unhappy that people they consider mediocre are treated as equal parts in their church. Socially polished Christians feel uncomfortable around believers who are socially awkward or marginal, and vice versa. Yep. I can think of one person in particular that I tried to reach out to, um, very eccentric, uh, older gentleman. Um, and I, I tried, I think I was too late. I think I was too late when I reached out to him and I, and I really, I pray for him. Um, and I've seen his wife recently at the church, but I, I you know, I tried to get him into my church, small group and it, it just didn't work out for whatever reason. I don't understand why, but yeah, anyway. So we do this. Uh, uh, people who we don't feel comfortable talking to, it's like, well, you know, uh, somebody will pick them up. Well, no. No, that means you have to. You know, you have to pick that person up and be their friend and, uh, you know, and listen to them. And occasionally, yeah, they're awkward. You know what? So are you. Get over it. <laughs> okay. So we may feel uncomfortable around people whose cultural emphases are different to ours. We may... And we may respond to all this as Peter did in apparently well-mannered ways. Yep. We politely sit by those other people in church, but we don't eat with them. We don't really become friends with them. We won't socialize with them, sharing our lives and homes and things with them. We will keep relationships formal and see them at official church meetings only. Guilty. Trying to think of, uh, I, 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 I have one deacon that I, that I talk to regularly. We're prayer partners and, uh, neither one of us is all that good about picking up the phone and, you know, it's, it's not his fault. It's just as equally my fault, uh, picking up the phone and just saying, Hey, how's it going? And, um, I think I might do that when I'm done here. Just, yeah. Anyway. All of this comes from not living in line with gospel. Without the gospel, our hearts have to manufacture self-esteem by comparing our group with other groups. But the gospel tells us we are, un we are all unclean without Christ and all clean in him. Lastly, the most subtle way to lapse into Peter's sin is to simply take our own preferences too seriously and endow with moral significance that what, what is only cultural. 
For example, it is very hard for Christians from churches with emotional expressiveness and modern music not to feel superior to churches with emotional reserve and classical music, and vice versa. We cannot see that we are just different. We believe that our style and customs are spiritually better. This leads to all sorts of divisions in the body of Christ. I know a couple of people that have left one church, gone to another because of uh, legal, legalism issues, because of uh, music issues, and um, I'm not saying they were wrong to do it. I wasn't in their shoes. Um, and yeah, you, you pray for healing in that situation. Uh, Paul sees the principle behind Peter, Peter's change eating practices, and in speaking to him about it, he points out the, pra- the principle rather than simply aiming to change his behavior. So he doesn't just say, hey, stop it, do this. Paul's basic line, God did not have fellowship with you on the basis of your race and culture. Though you were good and devout, your race and customs had nothing to do with it. Therefore, how can you have fellowship on the basis of race and culture? God doesn't love me because I'm a cisgendered, Caucasian, American male. Okay? You know. And, you know, he, does, he doesn't love me because I grew a really great beard. Okay? So, you know, it's just as ridiculous as anything else. So, um, yeah, nationalism gets gets in there tight. Uh, I think, uh, and, and I'll bring up... Uh, politics uh in this particular case um i know every you know most most people are on facebook now and there is uh, one i haven't seen anything from it for quite a while but it's called uh christian left and um to me that's just a divisive name right there and i looked it up there actually is not one that says christian right does that say anything no um, but um, it, the fact that you know people want to divide themselves, uh, uh, Hillary versus Donald Christians, and uh, you know, and those of us in between that uh, just look at them both and just you know can't stand to see either one of them as presidents, or uh, you know, people who um, you know something near and dear to my heart is is uh, 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 people who uh, abortion, and I'm uh, very much pro life and. Uh, uh, there are people. Most Christians, I think, ninety nine percent of Christians will be would be to are, are in their own lives pro life, uh, but don't feel that they should they should be able to say anything to somebody else. You know, there's a there's might be a division there. Um, so uh, you know, just uh, things that we can easily get divided on. Uh, very key core issues. Uh, 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 social justice as it were, I don't know, I'm rabbit ears, uh, social justice issues there. Um, Paul does not simply say that racism is a sin, which it is. He uses the gospel to show Peter the spiritual roots of, of the mistake he's making. Paul says the roots of racism are resistance to the gospel of salvation. In other words, racism is a continuation of works righteousness in one part of our lives. It is born of a desire to find a way to feel we are in some way better or righteous. It is forgetting that we are saved by grace, a failure to bring our relationships with other cultures in line with grace salvation. That's right. So if you're a member of a, of a racial majority, your race's cultural pride is fairly easy to see. If you're a member of a racial minority that is often put down, discernment of justification through racial pride is a bit more complex. But it, resur- but it surfaces when you begin to think, I'm more noble than you of the dominant race. I have suffered more, and I'm not an oppressor like you. Uh, yeah, that's a touch you want to unpack, isn't it, right there? I'm more noble than you of the dominant race, so somebody's more noble than me because they have suffered. I, I know people that argue that. And uh, because they've suffered more than um, what they feel I have. I mean, I can argue how much I, how difficult a life I've had and how challenging life has been for me and those, and they won't want to listen to it. 
And it's almost comes to the point of one upping each other on, yeah, I was more miserable than you were. Oh, no, no, no. So <laughs> that happens. It can happen really easy. Pretty soon, you know, fists are flying. Uh, Paul's approach makes all the difference. Paul did not simply say, you're breaking the rules, even though Peter was, but you've forgotten the gospel, your own gracious welcome in Christ. Paul did not focus so much on sinful behavior as on the sinful attitude of self-righteousness that lay beneath it. This is the Christian way of opposing someone. When you're trying to motivate some people by urging them to see their riches and love in Christ, then you personally are pointing to their value and dignity as you appeal. But when you try to motivate people by threatening them, you will probably feel little respect for them as you do so. And they will, rightly, sense that you are not on their side. When we use God's grace as a motivator, we can criticize sharply and directly, but the other person will generally be able to perceive what we are nonetheless for them. That we are nonetheless for them. No wonder Paul was winsome in this, it was winsome, winsome in this situation. Um yeah, and that's how you do it. That's how you criticize somebody. But you do it in love. You do it with Christ's love. You tell them, you know, you're doing the wrong thing. This, You're taking um, the love that Christ has for you, and, you know, you're not paying attention to that. And, you you know, realize the grace that you have and, you know, apply that to the rest of your life. Give that grace to other people, whether you are the, you know, the dominant or the, or the, or the, you know the lesser, uh, 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 less less majority. I got to be careful of that. Isn't that crazy? I have to be careful of how I word that now, because these things have gotten so sensitive. Um, so justification through racial pride is so dangerous, so dangerous. Um, keep this in mind too. Peter's racial pride was grounded in fear. When our sin is rooted in fear, we need to be loved and strengthened in order to get the courage to do the, to do right despite our fear. Not only was Peter's criticism out of line with the gospel, his cowardice was too. As we'll see, Peter is justified in God's uh, in God's eyes. So why does he feel the need to be justified in anyone else's? If Paul had only, had, had only said, "Your cultural superiority is in violation of the rules of God," his cowardice would have remained unaddressed, dormant, and ready to make itself known. In a different way, but in reminding him that he is justified already, Paul is saying, Peter, you don't need approval from these men. You've already got Christ. We don't often remember to treat each other in this gospel-founded way. Christians tend to motivate others with guilt. We tend to say, you would do this if you were really committed to Christians, indicating that we are committed and all that is needed all that is needed is for others to become as good as we are. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is why so many churches quench the motivation of, uh, of people for ministry. In our shoes, Paul would say, remember the grace God has showered on you. What does living out and enjoying that grace look like in this situation? And the questions for reflection. In which areas have you been increasingly walking in line with the gospel over the last month, the last year? And are there people in your church that you have not been eating with because they are not like you? What self-righteousness lies beneath this attitude? How could you motivate yourself and other Christians l less with guilt and more with the gospel? And these very good questions. Um... As with all these, this is now on to part two. Uh, good time for some people to take a break if you need to. Anyway, justification by faith. The climax of Paul's speech to Peter in front of them all. Think about that. Uh, comes in verse 16. We too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Justified by faith is central to the Christian faith. It is Paul's nutshell summary of the gospel, but we often assume that we and everyone else have grasped what it means and what impact it will have in our lives. And even in saying we mustn't assume we all understand it, we often forget to spell it out what it is we mustn't assume. But since we see, we see here that even an apostle such as Peter needed to learn more about what it means to be justified by faith. It's likely that we do too. Yeah, you think? Um, 
So first, should we connect the concepts of justification by faith with Paul's controversy with Peter? Essentially, the dispute was about cleanliness. Jews did not eat of Gentiles because they were unclean, and you had to be clean to worship God. When Peter refrained from eating with Gentiles, Paul reminded him of what he had learned through Revelation, that in Christ we are clean. In the Old Testament, you had to be clean, keeping with the ceremony laws, to go to worship, to be acceptable in the eyes of the presence of God. Though the word clean does not show up in verses 11 to 13, that is what circumcision and eating and all those rules and regulations were about. Um, in this, It's in this context that Paul introduces justification. So justification is essentially the same thing as being clean. To be justified is to be acceptable for fellowship with God. I'm trying to get this thing along my way. Hopefully you can still hear me well. It's starting to irritate me. Uh, let's see what's going on. Okay, I think we'll, we'll try that for a little bit. Uh, so Paul switched terms on us. Um, kind of more of a, a legal at word here in the word justification. Um, uh, and the opposite of clean is polluted. Uh, okay. Um, the, the opposite of just of justification is justified is condemned. Uh, think about that. He went from uh, clean, you know, with the circumcised and, and eating, eating ceremonial laws to justified. So you're either justified through Christ or you're condemned through the law. Um, JJ Packer helpfully summarizes what Paul means to justify in the Bible means to declare of a man on trial that he is not liable to any penalty, but is entitled to all the privileges due to those who have kept the law. Justifying is the act of a judge pronouncing the, the, the opposite sentence to condemnation, that of acquittal and legal immunity. So that's, that's the difference between justify and clean, and clean. We're justified through Christ, and we're cleansed. We're justified. We're the opposite of condemned. We're justified. We, we, are, we, we, we are found to be clean already in Christ. In spite of everything that we do. That's incredible because I do a lot of stupid things, people. Not by observing the law. If we are justified by faith in what Christ has done, we are also not justified by what we do. Law observance is not what saves. So, yeah, so how you act and how you do these things is not what saves you. It is truly by faith alone. It is by Christ, uh, faith in Christ that, that you are saved. Uh, through the law, I died to the law. He can't mean that we no longer obey the law of, law of God. Consider all the rest of Paul's writings. Doesn't he tell Christians that, we, that they must obey the law? For example, Paul tells the Corinthians that sexual immorality is wrong. And he bases this on what Genesis says about marriage. What does it mean? What it does mean is that Paul died to the law as a way of being saved. He died to the law's condemnation. If we are not justified by the law, but by Christ, then we cannot condemn us. If I am, if I am feeling condemned, and if I fear that God will no longer hear my prayers or care for me, then I have simply forgotten that I am dead to the law. I have forgotten that it can't harm me. So... Paul is saying, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. And I would not have known how unable I am to keep the law except through the law. Law was, it was there to show how screwed up you are and how, much you, how, and how many things you're doing wrong. And it, ultimately, um, I've heard Orthodox Jews say, I keep as many of the laws as I can. So, it tells me you can't keep all of them. And this was the covenant, as I understand it, that was bringing the Jewish people into a relationship with God. But they couldn't keep all of it. They couldn't do it. Neither can we. Uh, and that's why we, have, we, we need the justification through Christ. So, if verses 16 and 19 became clearer when we look closely at them, we cannot really be said for verses 17 and 18, which are quite obscure. 
Perhaps the best way to read them is saying, if someone who knows they are justified by faith sins, it is because justification by, by faith in Christ promotes sin? Not at all. But if someone who professes faith in Christ keeps on with the same sinful lifestyle, rebuilding the sinfulness that Christ died to destroy the penalty for, making no effort to change, then it proves that this person never really grasped the gospel but was just looking for an excuse to live in disobedience with God. Yeah, I have actually heard those words said in one shape or another. Uh, People who thought that um, you can make mistakes, just ask for forgiveness, and it's fine. And yes, except when you do it knowing that it's wrong. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Um... I'm going to go rob a bank or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have an affair and I'm just going to ask for forgiveness. It'll be fine. And uh, then I'll have an affair again and I'll ask for forgiveness and it'll be fine. Yeah. Try that one. Try that with your wife or your husband. See how that works out. God forgives me. He said it right here. No, that's not what he said. So, Verse 19 is Paul's brief commentary to, to on how someone who is truly justified by faith will view life. Because Paul died to the law, he can now live for God. The implication is that before he came to faith, while he was trying to save himself through the law, Paul never really lived for God. He was being very moral and good, but it was all for Paul and never for God. When Paul was obeying God without knowing he was accepted, he was obeying to get a reward for for what he could get from God, not out of sheer love for God himself. Now that he is justified and accepted, Paul has, has a new motive for his obedience that is far more wholesome and powerful. He wants simply to live for the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's read that. For through the law I died, and to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We will see much more about this in Galatians 5. For now, Paul wants us to understand that our acceptance gives us new and stronger motive motive for obeying God than than justification by works ever could. Here then is a paraphrase of verse 19. The law itself showed me that I could never make myself acceptable through it. So I stopped living to it. I died to it as my Savior. Though I obeyed God, God before, it was simply to get something from him. It was only for my own sake. Now I obey him simply to please him. I now live for him. Do you do that? Do you? Are you going to church and praising Jesus and worshiping him for him? Or are you doing it for you? Because I've been on both sides of that. Um, and I can be on both sides of that in a day in, within a day, within an hour of my life. I could be in the next hour. I could be easily, um, you know, doing what I do, uh, for me, <laughs> you know, because I want to get to heaven because <laughs> I want to have a better life because I want, uh, you know, so-and-so to, you know, it was cancer to be going away so I can feel good about something. Um, so what do you do? I mean, you know, this is, this is uh, one of the pitfalls of being human. Verse 20 is a restatement of verse 14. We need not live our lives in line with the truth of the gospel. Now that Christ's life is my life, Christ's past is my past. I am in Christ, which means that I am as free from condemnation before God as if I had already died and been judged, as if I had paid the debt myself. And I am as loved by God 
as if I had lived the life that Christ lived. Wow. And I am as loved by God as if I had lived the life Christ lived. Sink that in. Let that, let's let that sink in. Now when I live my life and make my choices and do my work, I do so remembering who I am by faith in Christ, who loved me so much. The inner dynamic for living the Christian life is right here. Only when I see myself as completely loved and holy in Christ will I have the power to to repent with joy, conquer my fears, and obey the one who did all this for me. Is it worth remembering that Paul's still speaking to Peter here? And so he finishes by reminding Peter that the Christian life is about living in line with the gospel throughout the whole of life. For the whole of our lives, we must go on as Christians as we started as Christians. After all, if at any point and in any way righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Think about that. If you could do it through the law, and if you could do it by being a good person, and you could do it by you know, your actions and your work by... Uh, by, by volunteering and by giving and by this and by that and how you treat this person and how you treat that person and, and, and how you eat the right things and how you say the right things. And if, you, if all that was getting you into heaven, then why did Christ die? Why? What was the point? If you could do it through being a good person, if you could get to heaven being good, what was the point of, uh, of Christ coming, down to, coming, coming to us, living among us, feeling hunger, feeling pain, feeling grief? If, you know, if it didn't, if, if the, that's what, because that's what it took. That's what it's taking for us to be right. know if you did that's all I've got on that you know. he gives a good synopsis of possibilities you know just a little story here you, you can read that on your own but yeah I, I, th I think I think about that and um, how do you respond to that how do you act with that concept of you know, somebody says, well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think good people can get to heaven. Well, if that's all it took. You know, that's all it takes to get to heaven, to get to be right with God. What was the point? Why did Christ die? Why was he the sacrificial lamb? What does it mean? So I think that's a perfect example of, of why, you know, proof that we needed him is because it happened because he did it uh, because he, he, he died on the cross. He was, and, and, and took all of our sin for him, you know, on him and, and God, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, God turned away from him. And he took that. He was suddenly out of communion with God for the first time in eternity. And he did that for us. And how do we thank him? And this is why this is why we have we, we, we do stuff for him is, is out of appreciation for that. This is why we do the other things, the works that we do. It's not to get into heaven, it's out of appreciation and love for what he did for us. You know, and we give to the poor, we do this, we do that, because we love him. And 
We want to obey him. If you love me, you will obey. And, you know, that's that's how we show him uh, and show ourselves that we love him. But it's not what's going to get us up to heaven. You know, if you know, it, it, you know, so uh, I, I have a real tough time with that, as you can see. So, yeah. So I've heard it so many times. Is Christ you know, the questions for reflection? The final final ones of this chapter is Christ's death everything to you? What difference does this make to your love for Him and your actions in life? Is it? Is it everything to you? Um. You know, we had uh, uh, the sermon this morning. Um. Uh, talked about you know the concept of you know just dipping your toes into the water and say, and saying ooh this feels good yep liking this yep got the salvation going yep feel good feel the love yep that's great that's great and, you know it's a total difference of that and jumping in wholeheartedly and doing and and, and being a disciple of Jesus and and listening to him and obeying him. Uh, that's the, it's the next big step and it's a hard step to take. And I, you know, and some days I don't feel like I've taken it. Some days I do. Uh, what difference does this make to your love for him and your actions in life? Answer that yourself. How would you explain justification by faith to someone who has never been to church before? Ooh. Justification by faith is... You know, how would you explain that? You know, I mean, I'm going to have to read this five more times just to be able to do a good job of that. So how would you explain the difference between being moral and being a Christian to someone who thinks being good makes them acceptable to God? Well, you could go on a rant like I just did. I probably wouldn't recommend that to somebody, you know, for, you know, to do that for somebody that's just looking. Whoa, touched a nerve there, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, we don't, you know, but um, uh, maybe a, a, a lighter version of that, <laughs> a milder version of that particular rant. How would you explain the difference? Um, you know, uh, just understanding that uh, you're, you can't be good enough. Um, you know, there's there's too many, too many mistakes that we make as people. You can't do it. Um well, this is that was the end of chapter chapter four in this book. We didn't do much with uh, with this one here because, like I said, I'd, I I got caught up in a bunch of stuff this week. Um, uh, this coming weekend, I have a, a men's retreat, and I'm probably not going to get a video out this coming weekend, but I uh, uh, will try to make up for it somehow, some way, to you. And um, I pray that. This all finds everybody well, that uh, um, you find joy and peace in your life. And uh, I pray that, uh, you know, the people that uh, are in need in your life, I have some specific ones in my life that uh, people who are in need, and uh, I pray that uh, uh, their health issues are, 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 you know, are touched by God and that they... Uh, they will come through this uh, with a new perspective, closer to Jesus, closer to God, um, and uh, hopefully knowing him better. Uh, so uh, I pray that you all do well uh, this, over this course this next week, uh, and to p possibly too. And um, shalom. God bless.